Well, welcome back. It was gorgeous down there. I walked down to the stone house a little bit earlier and it was just great and I kind of wish we could have done this on the lawn or something because it was just so, so beautiful. Um, it is Saturday and we're all a little, little bit uh, tired so I'm going to try to keep this a little bit light. But uh, I want to talk about the changing nature of money. Uh, money has changed in the economy. Uh, it, it, it looks different, it behaves different, it affects the, the real sector differently, it affects inflation differently, and we're still coming to grips with that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the background, and then Ja is going to be talking about, uh, about ways of measuring money that may be uh, better and more effective. Um, I, I, I hope that it'll be, be a nice package for you. I thought I would start with this. This is the velocity of money, and if you look at this chart, you, you have to believe some things changed. Uh, what you don't have, this was a graph I had to ha happened to have handy, so I used it, but that, that trend line and that nearly straight line uh, growth pattern in velocity goes back to, to World War II. So uh, that's what we had come to depend upon, that velocity was growing at a, at a steady rate, three, four percent a year, it's like clockwork. Velocity is very important. We'll talk about it more in a second. It, it is, in fact, the, the, the average uh, number of times that a dollar changes hands in the economy over the course of a year. Uh, but it also is it's the reciprocal of, the, of money demand. So it says something about money demand in the economy, which is important to economists and maybe not to other people, but it, we, we get all, all giggly about it. So we'll explain more why in a moment. But it's, it's a very core element. It's very much a reflection of the economy. As you can see, right around 1980, 81, uh, something drastic changed. Something drastic changed in velocity. So when a core variable like this shifts, we, we pay attention. This is the velocity of M1. There is a velocity for each monetary aggregate. So I want to make it clear which one we're talking about. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to, push you through this, this little bit of painful stuff and then we'll, we'll forget the equations, okay? <laughs> have to do a little bit, but you should have seen this in Mishkin's class. I mean, I'm sure this is not new to you, the, the quantity theory, but I just want to emphasize a couple of points here. Uh, all else equal, the quantity theory suggests that, that the price level is proportional to the money supply. Um, but more explicitly, we have this equation of exchange, the money supply times velocity is equal to the price level times real GDP. And the uh, the idea here is that if in this whole economy we produce 10 items that cost $100 a piece, that's real GDP times the price level, we have $1,000 that, of goods that were bought and sold in the economy over the course of a year. If there was only $200 in the economy, we could still buy the $1,000 worth of goods. The dollars would just have to get respent five times. Okay, so I buy something with somebody, they take my dollars, they buy something else. So there's a lot captured in this little equation, a lot captured. Um, it re reflects economic activity, it reflects how, pr how price levels are set. In growth rates, uh, this is the percent change in the money supply, the percent change in velocity, the inflation rate, and the percent change in GDP. And now they're additive because we're in growth rates. So to sort of play it out, if velocity and GDP were not to change, and we're not suggesting that they, they don't, but on the very short run, money, uh, the, uh, the GDP isn't going to change dramatically overnight. And uh, if, velocity, if velocity were, were constant, then the, the growth rate of the money supply would have to equal the inflation rate. Now, if we back off from that rigid, rigid statement, you get sort of the monetarist arithmetic that was popular uh, until probably the mid-1980s, which you notice coincides with that breakdown in the, in the whole velocity thing. Uh, and they said that if velocity is stable, like it was from World War II until about 1980, if it's growing at 3% per year, it doesn't matter that it isn't constant, you know what it is. So you can plug it in the equation, it's not, it's not very difficult. Uh, if velocity is stable, you can pick, <coughs> at least in theory, you can pick a money supply growth rate that allows GDP to grow uh, without constraint and uh, achieves no inflation. So there, there is a growth rate of the money supply you could, you could produce that would allow GDP to grow and would produce no inflation. 
So that's, that's the, the monetarist ideal, constant growth rate rule, but that's where it comes from. But it goes beyond that. Central bankers still think this way. They're looking at, at how they're going to grow the money supply in order to achieve the ends in inflation and, and output. And this equation, ex post, has to exist. It has to work. It's, 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 it's arithmetic. It's, it's not economics. It's arithmetic. So it has to actually, actually work. Okay? But then the questions that naturally arise is, is velo velocity actually stable? Okay, pretty obvious, but is it? And can you actually pick the money supply growth rate? If you can't do these things, then what does the central bank expect to do? Right? Brings us back to this graph. Is velocity stable? I'm going to go with no. I mean, you know, you can pick your own choice. Me, uh, you know, it's a naive look, but I'm thinking, no, not real stable, okay? And so the question is, what the heck happened here? We're here to talk about changes in money, so let's talk about how this works. Um, I outline these just so you could maybe follow. I know we're still a little bit asleep, but uh, we had a big deregulation that occurred. Uh, it was signed into law by, by Carter and, and was implemented over a period of years into 1986. Uh, it, it uh, removed the Reg Q, Reg Q requirement. Now that's all technical. Let's talk about what it really is. In the Great Depression, people became worried about money, became worried about everything. The economy was a bust, you know, we had to deal with it. So Reg Q uh, prohibited banks of paying interest on checking accounts. No interest on checking accounts. Uh, keep in mind that checking accounts, and I'll re emphasize this in a moment, they're part of M1. Uh, savings accounts are not part of M1. So you're, you're talking about different aggregates and different kinds of, of forms of money already. So anyway, no interest on checking accounts. You could pay interest on savings accounts, but banks were limited to five and a quarter percent uh, interest on uh, savings accounts, and savings and loans could pay five and a half. That was it. That's the rule. Well, you may remember in the, in the 1970s, we had an inflationary spell in the U.S. It wasn't big by world standards, but by U.S. standards, it was pretty severe. And interest rates were, well, inflation rates were, were well above the five and a quarter and five and a half percent. So people were losing money every day, holding money in banks. And as you can imagine, money was flooding out of banks, literally. We watched it every day in the Wall Street Journal, every week you'd see the money numbers, and you'd see them literally move out of the banks and into the money market funds because people were trying to get enough return to at least offset the inflation. Brokerage houses stepped into this and figured out, hey, here's a, here's a deal we can get into. And they uh, started offering these, these central assets or central management accounts. Merrill Lynch was one of the pioneers in this. You could open a brokerage account, and they had a deal with a bank uh, and what they did was, uh, every night they would, uh, they would sweep your money out of money market accounts, put them in the bank, pay off the checks that you had submitted, and then sweep them back uh, into the money market accounts. So you get money market rates, but you could pay your checks. Savings and loans formed now accounts, ne negotiable order of withdrawal accounts, which were interest-bearing checking accounts. And because they were not demand accounts, they could exist under the law. Demand account? A checking account is a demand account. The whole idea of the checking account was I can go up to the teller window and say, I want to take $100 out of my checking account, and they have to give it to me. That's demand. Okay. A savings account, legally, no bank is as stupid, okay, but, but legally, I mean, I can walk up to the, the window and say, I want to take $100 out of my savings account, and the bank can say, well, come back next Tuesday and I'll have your money. It's not a demand account. Okay, they, they, have, they have some leeway. Now, now the, the reality is, like I said, banks aren't that stupid. They know that if they, if they don't do this, they don't give you your money, then you're gonna get a little bit worried and you're gonna wanna take your money out. But there is a, a, a real difference. And that was a big scare with the negotiable order of withdrawal accounts, was that you would go to your savings and loan, you write a check or something, and it would be held for some period of time would not be paid immediately and you might get into trouble because you didn't pay your light bill on time or something. There was that concern. But that blew over because, again, banks aren't that stupid. Okay, but I'm just pointing out there's a difference in these kinds of accounts. And what I'm also describing is that 
the financial industry set upon circumventing Reg Q in that environment. And they did. They effectively did that. So at some point, the banks go to Congress and say, okay, you got you got to do one of two things. Either you've got to stop them from doing what they're doing, or you've got to let us compete by allowing us to pay interest on checking accounts. Okay? It so sounds reasonable. Congress kind of went, oh, that was a, you know, and they, they realized that it's already happened, it's, that the financial industry is going to find ways around the regulation. And so they decided the easiest thing was just to deregulate, just, just let the banks pay whatever interest they want. This has, a, this has a very big impact. I mean, it, it, it implies that, that now I can get interest on a checking account uh, and the opportunity cost of holding money in an M1 type account in, in a checking account is suddenly less than it was before. I'm not giving up as much interest to hold my money in a checking account. I'm not foregoing the interest of a savings account and getting nothing in my, my checking account. I may not get quite as much as I get in my savings account, but I get something. So the opportunity cost of holding money has changed. And suddenly this whole issue of what are the, the, the rates of return on the different kinds of money, and how does that affect which money I want to hold, and how will I, what will I spend from? Oh yeah, and they, they even, you know, we might as well make it more complicated. Let's peop, let people write a certain number of checks on their savings account too. Yeah, that'll make it really blurry, you know. And, and some banks have money market accounts, you know, directly. Oh man, now I've got all this range of accounts. I can write checks in most of them. I get different interest rates. So suddenly holding money becomes different and the way I make transactions out of money held in different aggregates uh, makes a difference. So now the M1 that we had didn't exist anymore. I mean, you, you couldn't, it wasn't a case of somebody just wasn't measuring it. There's no way that, you, that M1 could mean the same thing it meant the year before. It just could not. Because I would be, people would take money out of savings accounts and put it into checking accounts, which are part of M1. Uh, so the amount of money in M1 was different. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't fix this. So there were two alternatives, neither of which was the same as the original M1, so they created an M1A and M1B. That's really getting confusing. And then somebody said, how about an MZM, zero maturity uh, measure? And it, it, we've said this proliferation of aggregates, you know, trying to figure out some way to get our, our arms around it. And then I imagine you have to kind of keep in the back of your head, you're a central banker like at the Fed, and you're trying to figure out how to manage the money supply. And you're not even sure what the money supply is, by the way but you're responsible for managing it, and we're trying out these different aggregates to get a grip on this thing. I mean, it really creates a problem. So suddenly velocity starts to change because people are moving money in and out of M1 type accounts and M2 accounts and so on. Now, as you can imagine, M2 is a little more stable than M1 because a lot of the accounts that we normally, you and I, normal people deal with, like checking accounts and savings accounts, they're all under M2, right? So you get a little less shifting about on M2, but the M1 one is going all over the place, which is why the Fed abandoned M1 as its primary measure, because they didn't know what it was anymore. But M2 is shifting too. It doesn't, it's not staying fixed, so the, it's, it's drifting too, and we'll talk about that more in, in a minute. In the current interest rate environment, just to skip forward to sort of anticipate, as you know, interest rates are all on the floor, right? They've all come down, which means that those differences in rates which have become critical, I've now become compressed and even made it, I mean, I have to be honest, I don't even have a savings account. Why? I mean, the amount of money I can get in interest on my savings account isn't worth the convenience of having it all in my checking account. You know what I mean? Those interest rates have collapsed and so the differences have changed. This is affecting the way I handle money. It's the way, it affects the way the Fed functions as well. Now, now, now keep in mind that, uh, that if you, uh, that, that how the monetary aggregates work, that uh, the base is at the core. This is, the, this is simply the bank reserves and the currency in circulation, a few odds and ends. And, and that's the core of the money and everything else grows out from that. M1 includes everything in the base and some other stuff like checking accounts, you know. M2 includes everything in the base and M1 and some other stuff like savings accounts, right? 
So this is a, sort of an expanding thing, but, but uh, as you, the, these different accounts, like checking accounts, savings accounts, whatever, they all have different reserve requirements by the Fed. Okay, that when you deposit money in a bank, let's say you take some money that you had buried in the backyard. My, my mother, well, she's not lucid these days, but she used to always call me and she remembered the Great Depression and she'd say, is it time for me to like put some money in a jar in the backyard? Cause, and she was serious, by the way, because she remembered those times, right? Well, somebody digs up some money out of the backyard and, and puts it in the bank. Um, then the bank takes that money and they, uh, I'm about to lose my thing here. They, they take that money and they're required to keep a certain amount of it uh, under the reserve requirements and they can make loans out of the rest, right? But that amount that they're required to keep, that's the reserve requirement, the reserve ratio, uh, that varies across these different accounts. It's not the same. So as money moves around across these accounts as a result of these changes, you're also changing the amount of reserves banks are required to keep. You're affecting lending, which affects interest rates, which affects economic activity. So it's all moving out from this, this, this whole problem of what, what is the aggregate and what are the interest rates on these, on these aggregates. So M2, M2 was more stable. Now I want to emphasize here, I'm gonna, I want you to look at the scale on the right, one and a half to 2.2, and I'll roll it back. And you see this is, three to 11, okay? I just want to make it clear that we're kind of, it's a smaller range, so it looks a little bit more volatile back there in the trend period, but that's because you're just sort of putting a magnifying glass on it, okay? So anyway, you've got that pre-1994 trend, and you can see it was kind of trending along. You didn't see the massive jump in 1980, you saw some jump. You can see it breaking out of that little range that I put up there. Uh, but it's a little, it's not as extreme. Not as extreme if you take into account you're under the magnifying glass. So uh, that's because a lot of the shifting was done between accounts that were all under M2, uh, but you're getting shifts from non-M2, M1, and M M1, right? You're getting, but it's all subsumed under M2, right? Question? I apologize, I might have totally fogged over this. <laughs> but, uh, the scale for the velocity, mm -hmm. It's the number of times per year that it's turnover per year. It's annualized. It's how many times per year does that dollar, does the average dollar have to change hands to buy GDP? So it's really GDP divided by the money supply. It's, it's important to know that. I mean, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a straightforward sort of a computation, but the implications are huge, so you know we get all excited as economists, I know. So you can go back to sleep, but I, I like it. I think it's really cool. All right, so anyway, so anyway, you can see that it's, it's trending pretty steadily, but then we get another break that is sort of M2 versus larger aggregates, apparently after, after 19, uh, early 1990s, let's say, early 1990s. So what happened? I mean, M2 has basically, it blew up and then it collapsed, and it's now at the lowest level it's been in 50 years. And that's enough for me. It gets my attention as an economist, you know. Lowest in 50 years must be something happening right there. Now, uh, what, what happened here, there's some interesting things that happened here. Uh, in the 1990s, um, I think I have a slide for this, but I may have misplaced it. Anyway, in the 1990s what happened was uh, the Fed uh, decided to allow banks to do something that, you know, kind of makes some of us kind of get that little creepy feeling under the back of your collar, you know. They, they told the banks that you can sneak out there at night and you can take money out of people's savings accounts and you can sweep them over into the, the checking accounts. As long as you put it back by the next morning. Oh. <laughs> okay, and you don't have to report it, and you don't have to tell us how much you're doing it, but that'll give you a little more money to, to push around, and you can make some more loans. It'll get you a little more returns, right? Uh, because the reserve requirements for, for one account is different than the other, and you're going you're gonna to be able to move money around between, uh, between checking and savings accounts at night at will, 
and make loans and then put the money back. And that allows you to make more money, more profits, and pay higher interest rates to your depositors. Banks got all excited, you know, they like making money. So all of a sudden they're, they're doing this and you're, they're moving overnight money between M, M, M1 and non-M1, M2 components, you know, overnight. So we get shifting going on here. Uh, this started to have implications, though, in terms of, of lending and, and larger aggregates. So all of a sudden, we don't even know what M2 is doing because it's all over the place and the velocity is, is collapsing. So back to the basic point is, is if you're trying to conduct monetary policy, you're trying to affect something like, you know, output, inflation, things like that, and you need to know what velocity is so you know what to do with the money supply, and your two primary aggregates are not behaving correctly. And a lot of it has to do with interest rates, interest being paid on, on different kinds of accounts, and how that affects people substituting across accounts, and about lending practices, and, and so many other things. It starts to just move out from that, from that core. Now, uh, this was, this is the, I knew I had a slide for this. So this is the, the Fed rule, uh, and about how they have the, uh, they have, they have allowed these banks to make these sweeps. These are called retail sweep programs. And uh, of course, to make this even more complicated, in 2008, the Fed started paying interest on reserves. And that confuses the sweep program issue as well, because now I can sweep and I can make loans or I can leave the money in reserves and I can collect interest uh, from the Fed on the reserves. It's not a lot, but it's riskless, easy, costless, Huge, why not? See the, so the Fed gives me money and then the Fed pays me interest on it. What a great deal, you know? I wish I could get in on this, you know? <clears throat> we've also had, during the same periods, we've had technology advancing. As you know, we have a lot of cashless payments. Um, if you make a purchase on a debit card, then the money comes directly out of your, your uh, demand account and uh, so that's, that would, th you would think would accelerate uh, velocity. It's gonna make money move more quickly. Uh, but if you use like credit cards or PayPal or something like that, then you, you can actually, I do this with my, my gasoline, I'm lazy. So I use my, one of my credit cards and I just buy all of my gas through the month on the credit card and then I pay the bill at the end of the month. So what you may or may not realize is when I put it on the credit card, that's not, that has nothing to do with money. That's, that's borrowing. That's a credit. Okay, it isn't until I, I make the payment at the end of the month that I've moved money. So by using credit cards, I've actually reduced the number of transactions I make with money. So velocity is slowed. So the more credit is used, um, the, 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 slow, the slower of the velocity. But the more debit is used, the, the more rapidly uh, velocity moves. And of course, PayPal has the peculiar thing, the reason I mentioned it here is I've just come to know PayPal over the last year or two and it's just interesting as an economist. Anyway, they, they'll either do it, they'll do it either way. They'll, they'll take the money from a credit card and they'll even sell you the credit card, which they'd really prefer to do, you know, or they'll take the money directly out of your account. So depending on which way you choose, you're gonna have a different impact on on, on velocity of money. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, issue, but I'm pointing out that these electronic means have changed the way money flows through the economy. Now, and of course, in 2012, 2013, uh, individuals can transfer money in and out of M1 or interest-bearing M2 on a smartphone. Okay, they just go on there and they move the stuff around. You can use ATMs, phones, handheld computing devices and computers, and you can move money across the aggregates in, on a whim. And so money's moving fluidly across these aggregates and people are responding to, to interest opportunities and to liquidity requirements. Uh, so again, interest rates play a, a, a key role. Uh, I discovered a few years ago that I can link my brokerage account directly into my bank account and I can instantly go online and transfer money between and these aren't even with the same institutions or even related institutions, but I can move money between my checking account and my brokerage account at will, which again is shifting things across aggregates and affecting the way that the money is, is behaving and about reserves and how reserves are being used. 
So all these accounts have different reserve requirements and pay different interest rates. And we're still treating these essentially as similar aggregates. And John's going to get into this, but the way that they compute something like M2 is they look at the list of the accounts and the, and the amount of money in each account nationally. They add them up across the banks, and they just add them up. But yet, they are very different. They're behaving altogether differently, and day by day, they're behaving more and more differently. And you need to be accounting for that somehow when you think about how money is, is being used. There are different, different kinds of money. I, I say have different amounts of moneyness. You know, they're, they're, they're more liquid or less liquid. Uh, and, and they're more like the money you're used to making transactions with. You know what I mean? Other ones are looking more like assets that you hold rather than assets you spend. And, and so all those things have to be accounted for some way. Yeah? The ECB, I know they focus on M3. Mm -hmm. Could that be like an answer to this problem? Well, John's going to tell you all about that. I don't want to steal her thunder, but, but no, you, you have the right idea. You, one way to do it is to look at broader aggregates. And uh, they, they started to do that, but lately, if you go to uh, the Fed website, they won't give you M3 or M4, right? Yeah. 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 I don't know why. She, maybe she can tell us why. But, but you know, no, that's the first step would be to get to broader aggregates where, where all of these shifts are subsumed under it. You've got exactly the right idea. But then you have the other issue is about how these differential interest rates and reserve requirements are affecting how money is flowing out of the banks, right? So, but yeah, you, you got the right idea. You're with us on this. So uh, this, this does represent a challenge to central banking. Now, we also had in the 1990s, I was actually, I actually experienced some of this in the late 80s when I was at the Fed, that uh, the Soviet Union uh, disbanded. I don't know what to call it, you know. Um, and uh, Eastern European countries started to democratize and marketize and uh, uh, open their economies, embrace markets, do things. Uh, obviously, it was a huge thing, and I can't find five words that would summarize, you know, it was obviously a major world event, especially to economists. Uh, but in most of those countries, it led to hyperinflation, at least for a period. And one of the things that happened is that, you know, families are amazing things. You know, if you're, if you're well, she's from Russia, so she, she you know, would know this. Uh, or, or Polina, who works with us, is from the Ukraine. Um, you have a lot of this, and it's great. It's what makes the country so, so strong. Uh, but they have families in these places, and so they would send them U.S. dollars to give them something they could hold on to and, and, and spend and, and, you know, take care of their needs. They're looking out for their families in these, these difficult times. Dollars were flooding out of the country. And I'm talking currency. Okay? Now, there are also deposits that move, but, but it's harder to get the deposits into some of these places, so they were taking currency. So I was actually at the Fed when we saw that our money supply was expanding, we saw the currency component was just getting blown out of proportion, couldn't even figure out. And we started doing studies and investigations. We found out it's all going out the door. It's going, it's going to Eastern Europe and, and Soviet Union. Well, it's really kind of cool. I mean, interesting to think that that, that would happen. I mean, it sort of makes sense, you know. Um, but there's another huge distortion as this money moves out and back uh, during that period. So as the dollars left the country, the money supply numbers got distorted, and it, and it also affected uh, the balance of, of aggregates like, like M1, because they include a little more than, than demand accounts and, and uh, currency. I want to mention the other part of my, my statement. Uh, the other part of my statement uh, earlier was that, you know, if you're going to control the money supply, velocity should be stable. and, and then the second question is, can you actually control the money supply? I mean, it sounds like obvious. And there was a great article that I read in the, the 19, from the 1980s. And they asked the, uh, this, this woman who was the, uh, the chief economist at the trading desk at the New York Fed. They actually, this, is how, this is how basic this got. Okay, this is not, you know, you can think of this in a theoretical fashion. But this was actually how basic it got. They asked her, they said, look, 
you do the open market operations. Do you think you control the money supply? <laughs> she said, well, she actually wrote this. She said, well, it feels like we control the money supply. I mean, it was the best answer she could give at the moment, you know. But, but certainly on the short run, uh, it's possible to, to increase dollars in circulation. But, uh, but on, the, on the longer run, you have issues that, that as, the, as the private sector goes into expansion, uh, these private firms and individuals need money. They demand money. And they go to banks. They make loans. Banks make the loans, which expands the money supply, which means the money supply is expanding endogenously. It's not the Fed increasing the money supply and stimulating the private sector. It's the private sector recovering, coming to the bank, and forcing the banking sector to deliver more money. So the first problem is, is the money supply isn't necessarily exogenous, meaning that it comes in from the sky. You know, Bernanke's talked about helicopter money, you know. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a phrase we use. I'm not giving him a bad time. We actually talk about that because there's a sense of injection from outside the system. We call it outside money. Uh, but in fact, uh, both outside and inside money are created by demand from the private sector. So if the Fed doesn't control the money supply, how do they conduct monetary policy in, in the traditional sense anyway? I mean, this, is, this is more problematic. I put this up here because I wanted to to make a, a, a point that, that the, the Fed is being told that it needs to stabilize uh, income, GDP, and, and achieve high levels of employment, keep inflation in check, and it has some responsibility with exchange rates. These are the ultimate goals. But we, we sometimes forget that they're back on the other end. This is the tail, and the dog that's wagging that tail is way the heck back over there. That's what they can actually do. They have open market operations, as you know, they buy and sell bonds. They have discount rates that they can, that, where they can make loans. Now, in recent years, another change in the system is they have changed the, the kinds of discount loans they can make. They're not limited to banks. They can make broader discount loans, which has changed the game considerably. And uh, in fact, even in open market operations, central banks around the world now are starting to buy stocks. Oh. I remember having this discussion when I was in the Greenspan Fed, and the, the, the concern that they had was, you know, so which stocks do we pick? I mean, you talk about a political nightmare, you know, you know I, th I, I think we'll buy AT&T, you know, or whatever. I mean, what are they, they going to buy? How do, they, how do they do this that doesn't wind up having a huge impact, not just overall in the market, but then, you know, allocatively across, across uh, stocks? And the political implications are huge. The opportunities for corruption are, are enormous. I mean, it's just, oh my gosh, you know. Uh, but, but in any case, the other banks are starting to do that. Of course, reserve requirements, as I've said, they're differential across different kinds of accounts. And one of the, the arguments being used to soak up the, the, the huge amounts of reserves the banks are holding now is to bump the reserve requirements. But this makes banks have to hold more in reserve against, uh, against their, their, uh, their deposits. Uh, but that is, one of the reasons we like open market operations is you can micromanage it. I can go out and buy one bond. You know, I, I can just, I can shift the money supply by $1,000. When you start tinkering with the reserve requirements, this is like trying to hammer thumbtacks with a sledgehammer. I mean, you, you are just majorly pounding the entire financial system and therefore the economy. This is not a small thing. It has huge implications. It can cause huge convulsions throughout the system. It's massive. And the other problem is that all banks, you know, we think of like the average bank. There's no average bank. Their reserve levels are all over creation. Small banks are often lent out you know, to much closer to their reserve requirements where large banks may be holding large amounts of reserves. So if you suddenly jack up the reserve requirements in, in an effort to soak up the reserves, you may put small banks out of business and you may benefit large banks. I mean, you're going to have a, an allocative effect across banks as well. It's not that simple. Now, if you give enough warning, they'll buy and sell reserves and try to make it happen, but I, it's not a trivial exercise is my point. So this is a, this is a huge tool. And of course, the Fed's paying interest on reserves now, which they also argue, we talked to, to Pollard at the SOMA 
he's a SOMA uh, manager at the Fed, and he was talking about using the interest on reserves as a way of holding back the flood of dollars when, as he said, the economy achieves liftoff. That was nice, liftoff. Um, so that when the, l the lending starts to happen and you've got to, to hold back those reserves, you raise the interest rates on reserves. But that implies a huge cost to the Fed, which has got to come from somewhere. But anyway, that's where they live. Now, what they're, they're looking at are things like reserves and Fed funds rate. They're trying to affect reserves. Now, in you know, Money and Banking 101, they tell you these amounts are the same thing. They don't. Uh, by 1970, and Bill Poole, who's, I guess he's at the, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Anyway, we knew that they aren't the same, that they actually, there's a slack between them. So we have to kind of play both of them. But the Fed does try to manage bank reserves. That's its primary target now. Uh, but they don't really care about reserves. These reserves are basically useless. And so are Fed funds rate. What they care about are monetary aggregates like M1, M2. Oh, yeah, but we don't know what those are anymore. Uh, uh, and, and market interest rates, right? Um, and they hope that those will have some impact on, uh, on the ultimate goals through what we call money income transmission mechanisms, that somehow how this money flows through the economy into these, these, these issues. So this is, a, this, it's, it's a long linkage, and it's not like, I mean, I, I had lunch one day with, with a vice chairman at the Fed, and, and I said, well, why don't you do this? You know, we were just having a light lunch, and I was being creative, and, he, and his re reaction was priceless. He said, because I don't have a knob or a lever like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> couple of southern boys having lunch but uh, you know but he's right you know I mean he wants to get out here but he can't get there he has no means to get there he's got that that's what he's got and by the way the the, the Board of Governors doesn't control the discount rate they only approve changes right so they, they even have some looseness in that yeah you were saying that the Fed can now um, make discount loans to things other than banks what yeah would Technically, I guess they can lend to anybody, but they're, they're, they're leaning toward financial institutions, but non-bank institutions. That's, that's where it goes. Has it been happening? Uh, I don't think it's been a lot. Uh, th there has probably been some. I don't have an accounting of that. But yeah, they, they can go beyond the banks, which is peculiar, right? So would that be, I mean, the idea of the banks is, <laughs> the discount rate is the. Never mind. <laughs> I mean, the federal funds rate, you think of the rate that banks loan to each other. That's the interbank rate. rate. That's what they, they charge each other, right. And the, the discount rate is usually below that, and it's, it, it's a lot of signaling that goes on with it. But uh, if, if the idea is that if, if a bank is in trouble, they can go to the Fed and they can borrow money. They, they, they can always go to the discount window and they can borrow money. So they don't wind up, you know, becoming insolvent overnight. You know, they, they, they can uh, get what they need. Of course, and in fact, they're even encouraged to do it a certain amount. Uh, it keeps the system kind of loose that they, you can imagine, you're running a Bank of America, you're making loans. At the end of the day, you go, oops, we had a good day. The, the, the loan officers lent out more than we expected. We're, we're, we're a little below our reserve requirements. So you just, you know, go to the discount window and you, Get some cash. Yeah. No, it, well, it's, it it varies, but uh, it it is uh, is often below. It's often below. Um, so they are. Um, they can always go. Originally, the idea was that with the founding of the Fed that you the bank would go to the the discount window. There really was a window, and uh, mm -hmm. they had a big big box behind them, and you would bring in loans, and they would buy them from you at a discount. So you could sell off your loans to, to, to get some cash, and you would use the you would use the loans as collateral. I'm sorry, you would use the loans as collateral, uh, and they would they would discount from the stream in order to figure out what they were going to give you. But it took about a day and a half for somebody to realize that oh, this is a pain. We'll have to build these things. We'll have to do these other things. So it became a loan, but it, but the terminology st stuck. You know, the, it's a discount loan. Steve, you said that. Um, the Fed, was the Fed considering buying equities or, or was buying equities? Right now, the Fed is not, but, not permitted to do that. But central banks around the world are starting to do it. I think Bank of Japan and the Bank of... No, it's the European Central Bank, I think, was talking about it. 
So they, it, it's, it's, it's a hot item. And all the stuff, that junk on their balance sheet, does that include, are there equities in that? No, no? but we'll get some of that. Not, not in this sense of, of just doing open market or, or doing a, a discount open market operations on, on, uh, on secu securities of that type. So there's a, there's a big, big gap here from one thing to the other. Now, if, if you don't know what the monetary aggregates are, maybe you can control the interest rates, and there's a problem with that as well. Let me see if I can find my interest rate graph. Yeah, treasury yield curve. Uh, traditionally, banks borrowed short and lent long. I think I said that right. <laughs> they, they, meaning that they took, uh, they, they took deposits, everyday deposits, and they turned them into loans. That's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, I'm, never, I'm not good with that phrase. I have to think about it. But anyway, uh, so there was a natural linkage to the yield curve. I mean, the short-term rates to the long-term rates. These are the interest rates on government securities at different maturities. Um, and so through, working through the banking system, the Fed was able to change overnight rates like Fed funds rates. And, and have an impact on the, the long end of the yield curve. And, and they don't quite have that, that anymore. Uh, it's all broken down. The, the, the market is segmented. Uh, there are many other alternatives, other financing, financing alternatives for businesses and individuals. And the, 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 the Fed's having a tough time working on the long end of this, this yield curve, which is where most of the borrowing is, is taking place, mortgages and, and so on. They're, we're not taking out a one-month car loan. We're not taking out a three-month mortgage, you know. So you've got to somehow get out on the long end of the curve if you're going to do something. So we'll get back to that in a moment. Now, uh, so the Fed does manage reserves, tries to manage reserves. And this shows excess reserves in the system. I'm giggling because, oh my gosh, you know. Uh, that line down there on the floor, going, it goes back. Uh, forever, you know. I mean, it's this is the norm was that banks would hold one or two percent over their required reserves. That was it, because they any money that they're sitting on in reserves, they're not making loans with, so they're not making any money. They're in business to make money. So this is like a factory refusing to ship product. You know, it's it's stupid. That's the technical economic term. It's stupid, you know. I've got a factory, I've got inventory, and people want to buy it, and I'm, nope, I'm not going to sell it to you. The banks have reserves. They don't lend it. They don't make interest. They don't, that's what they do. So they lent out to, to the reserve requirements with a, you know, one or two percent error in their, you know, pad. But look at what they did in 2008. They, they went completely nuts. They, they really expanded reserves. Now we're, we're close to, we're over 15 times required reserves uh, as of this last week. This is the latest week. I went week to week. So you can see it's explosive and you can see the spike in 2013 where they even started to expand again. I was getting sort of a warm feeling because I could see this trending down from 2011 toward the end of 2012 and I thought, oh good, they're finally starting to work off some of those reserves. And then I see this huge spike at the beginning of the year. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. So more, more money moving. If you think the levels are scary, look at the, the rates. The, the stability of the financial system is, it, is, is the issue here. And look at that. These are percent changes, annual rates and the monetary base, which is at the core. That was the core in that little diagram I showed you of the monetary system. Look at those rates, 80%, over 100%. 40%. These are not small numbers. Gee, you think it might be destabilizing. I, I don't know. It's a little frightening. These are big, big numbers. This shows, if you look at M2, first of all, going back to 1985, wow, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing to, to wonder about. It, it's almost a straight line. I mean, it grows at this rate. And, of course, you can see below it the monetary base. And as I mentioned, the monetary base is expanded into the money supply. Because monetary base is currency and reserves. The bank takes the reserves. They make loans. They loan up to the reserve requirement. And the multiplying process occurs. The bank makes a loan. Somebody uses it to buy something. They write a check. The person who receives the check deposits it. The bank keeps percentage of that in reserve and they make another loan and it keeps expanding through the system and blows out into the money supply and circulation. 
This is in log scale. I did this on purpose. You notice that the, the base and M2 are parallel. I mean, there's almost no deviation, okay? Uh, and that means the rate of expansion is constant. In fact, if you look at just loosely there between the two lines and you compare it to the, the bars that are up there on the, um, the axes, they're almost the same. So it's like an order of magnitude, 10 times, you know, loosely speaking. Very constant. And then 2008. Oh my gosh, we're talking about the changing nature of, the, of money. It, it, it goes haywire. But what is interesting is that the Fed was very clearly doing whatever it took with the base to keep M2 growing at the same rate. And I can't say that's a bad thing. Because if you're trying to get out of a recession, you don't want to have liquidity issues, you don't want to have credit issues. You, you want to keep this thing liquid. And so they were doing that, but they were going to some extraordinary ends to make that happen. And of course, as I mentioned last night, yesterday, you suddenly have M2, if you zoom in on this, uh, after the first of the year starts to collapse. And you can imagine they get a little jumpy, and so they expand the reserves even more, hence the spike on the end of, of the, the reserves. Uh, so they're getting very jumpy about this. Okay, how do I get this to go? There we go. So we look at the multiplier, the M2 multiplier. This is the, that, that rate of expansion between the base and M2, which I said was pretty constant. You can see here from about 1995 to 2010, it was holding it at eight, around eight, okay? Very constant. And then it starts to fall apart. Now they, they go in there and they, they have QE1 and QE2 and lots of QEs. And one of the things that people don't want to talk about much is that the reason you have a QE is because interest rate policy stopped working. You, you, you can no longer do anything useful with the, with the interest rate. It's not influencing anybody, and by the way, the interest rates are already on the floor. There's nowhere to go with interest rates. So you're hoping that if you pump some more money into the system, you provide some additional liquidity, maybe you'll get lucky, right? But it's like pushing a string. They pumped out the money in QE1, and all that happened was the multiplier just collapsed. So this is pushing the string. Yeah? Is it possible that, that um, the decline in the multiplier is related? It's like diminishing returns with relation to the money supply. Like the idea is that because the monetary base is so large now, compared to what it was historically, <laughs> you can't expect the multiplier to be as large as it was. You, as, well, that's right. The output just is not responding. And so you're not seeing the economic activity stirring. So you're not getting the demand for the dollars and so on. So you're, you're right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collapse. You've, you've reached a point where more money in the system just isn't doing anything. You know, and we had, we had another experience with a QE back in 62. And, and Bernanke knows this. I mean, he, you know, he's read the literature. And it, it was a failure. It didn't do much of anything. Um, and so one has to believe that a lot of the QEs are Bernanke trying to jawbone, try, try to affect uh, people's expectations and see I'm doing something, I'm, I'm, I'm QEing, you know, and don't you feel better, you know, I, because it, all that's happening is it's collapsing under the weight of it. Very little of it's moving out into, into M2 and therefore into economic activity. So we're now we're at the point that for every new dollar of monetary base, we're only getting $3.40 increase in the money supply. So what are they really doing? Under the QE3, they were, they were buying $85 billion worth of, of bonds every month. And that's just remarkably similar to the amount of the, the funding requirements by the Treasury every month. Hmm. I wonder if they're just monetizing the debt. Yeah, it could be. Okay. If it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? Anyway. So we look at the... the uh, Oh yeah, sure. Well, the idea is that uh, if the Treasury is trying to sell bonds to finance the deficit, uh, those are new bonds that are going out into the bond market and they're competing for dollars. And the magnitude of them is large, of course. And so it's enough that if the Fed were to do nothing, they would simply, the interest rates would get bid up uh, as a result of that. So the, the Fed is a, a really adopting a kind of a passive policy approach. Let's expand the money supply uh, let's, by buying, buying bonds at a rate equal to what the Fed's selling so that we can keep the interest rates where they are. Okay, so that way we won't have interest rates rising and choking off the recovery. The, the downside is, is that 
they're expanding the money supply every month to do this, and eventually it's got to be inflationary. So, but that's an accommodative policy. They're accommodating the, uh, the, the fiscal. Is it a causality that it will become a, like a inflationary, <coughs> that it will create inflation? It'll become inflation if and when it actually, the money moves out into the street and starts to buy goods. And that's what Bernanke's banking on. That's a bad pun, isn't it? I didn't even intend that. I'm sorry. But anyway, he's, 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 bank, he's banking on the idea that, that uh, when they get liftoff, and that's the term they're using at the Fed, when the economy finally does start to move and the lending would occur, they're going to quickly pull back that money and, and get, it, you know, get it back out of the system before it becomes inflationary. And people wonder, will they be able to do it? I don't know. This shows the maturity distribution of U.S. Treasuries uh, held by the Federal Reserve, and you can see that prior to 2008, uh, most of the, uh, the, the, the things that the bonds they were holding were one year or less, okay, and the rest was kind of down in the mud. You got one year, maybe five to ten or whatever, one to five, you got one, one year or less, one to five, and the rest of it's in the mud, you know, they're, they're in short-term securities, and now you can see that out here they, they really bought into long-term securities, and this is the twist. We talk about the twist, and it's the problem with the yield curve I just mentioned, is that if you want to affect real people and real corporations, you've got to affect long-term rates. And they couldn't get a hold of the long end of the yield curve uh, direct, you know, indirectly you know, by changing interbank rates and reserves, so they actually went out and started buying long, long bonds as a way of trying to affect those long-term rates directly because they've been having trouble getting the interest rate policy to work. QEs go directly for the long end of the yield curve, find some way to try to get an impact on the real sector to get some stimulus going. This shows the composition of, of Federal Reserve assets. As you can see in early 2008, there's this dramatic shift. And so you've got the rescue operations going on, you've got long-term credit uh, uh, purchases, you've got all these things. They've shifted their, their whole uh, balance sheet uh, to try to get onto that, that long end of the yield curve and bail out specific uh, sectors of the economy, uh, which is fundamentally different. That's the key point for this discussion. It's fundamentally different than what happened before. This is night and day. This is not the way the Fed traditionally operated. Okay, And they're, they're treating this in a very different way. So, uh, just to, to, to wrap, I mean, uh, there's been this issue about draining the reserves. Uh, it's been in the newspapers uh, lately. Uh, as we said, and when those reserves start to move out, that's when you start to get the inflationary effect. Um, the Fed is even engaged in exercises. Pollard talked about this specifically, where they went in and they, they did, they didn't tell anybody, but they went in and did these buying and selling exercises on bonds just to see if they can move large numbers of bonds in and out of the marketplace without making too much of a splash, you know? Because they, if they're going to be able to clear, to clear that portfolio, they're going to have to be able to move a lot, of, a lot of money fast, and they're trying to see how much they can move without causing uh, disruptions to the financial system. So they're, they're looking at ways to do it. They may res increase reserve requirements. They can increase the interest rate on reserves most likely to be some combination of those things, right? And now they're talking about ramping into it and doing it more gradually, which I think is smart. I, I really think that's the right idea. So they're also working on some programs involving long-term, longer-term repos. They're trying to get creative and figure out ways to do this, which only tells you they really care about this and they're really worried about this. They're trying to find some way to do this and I'm glad that they care and that they're worried because maybe we'll have a better outcome. <laughs> I'd rather think that they get it right. Um, just as a little exercise to show you how you can play with this, if you uh, assume that they were able to, and I'm just picking this number sort of out of the air, but if they were able to drain off 25% of the reserves and <coughs> the multiplier went back to eight, you would still have almost uh, $4 trillion in new M2 dollars hitting the street. You know, not the same day, I hope, but you know. It's going to move. It's going to move out, which would be an increase of 40% of or about six times the current growth rate. And if that happens, this is a graph: 10-year uh, averages, money supply growth, and inflation rates from 103 countries. You can see that a 40% uh, money supply growth is consistent with a 15% inflation rate. Now you can pick your own number. I, I don't really. This is not about the number. It's about the process. I mean, you can see that that. 
how much money moves out of out of uh, you know reserves into into the money supply that it moves out of MB into the monetary base into M1 and M2 that's going to have an impact on what the inflation rates are and and how successful they are will depend on what that money supply growth rate winds up being it's going to push you back down and we're going to hope that they get it down to like five percent and we're down there with real low inflation but that's sort of the way it works that's to connect it to the inflation rate yeah. Their, their exit plan, uh, uh, they're, they're optimistic. They believe that they can, they can absorb it. They'll either, they'll either raise the rates and contain it, uh, at the same time increasing the reserve requirements to hold that in place long enough. They don't have to hold it forever. Just long enough to, to feed it out to the market and bring that down. And if they, can, if they can reverse operations that way, then they may be able to come back to a reasonable number. And that's what we all hope for, because we live here too, right? But I, I'm not trying to be alarmist. I'm not trying to suggest this is the number. I'm just trying to point out this is the mechanics, right? Is that money moves out, depending on how big the money supply bump is, that's going to directly affect the inflation rate that you get. But all this, of course, even depends on is the money supply that they're reporting really the correct money supply? You know, and, and so there's, there's another, another issue. So. That's some of the changes that have occurred in the financial system and with money over the last few years. Uh, any any questions? I know you guys want to take a little break, and Jaw's going to talk. Yeah. So, what is the relationship with the reserve requirements and sort of this overall stability of the banking system? Since there there is that argument that they're trying to that it's necessary to keep those high reserves even though. Well, one of the things that they've done is, is there's, there's kind of two parts to that. One of the things they've done is that they, they're starting to, to, to not make so many differences between the different kinds of accounts and the reserves because it's kind of useless to do that, <laughs> which, is, which is smart, okay. But it also, it, it, it avoids shifting by the banks to, to achieve the higher rates of return, and so that's stabilizing the system. So now that that's stabilizing, then if you start to, to raise up those reserve requirements, it's going to hold more of those reserves in place, but you're going to have to do that carefully. As I said, you've got some banks that aren't holding as much in reserves relative to deposits, and, and so they could be hurt by this, so they're going to have to figure out. Now they may, there's been even some suggestion they may uh, do it differentially, that they'll say if your bank has this much in assets, then your reserve requirement is this, and if your bank has more in assets than you, you know, because a small bank would have less latitude, you know, they've got a small num smaller number of deposits to play with, you know, uh, where the large bank might have more flexibility, and so there may be a way to do it differentially. But they're, they're looking at that, and that makes sense, but you've got to be careful because it's that sledgehammer. You, you, you don't want to just, you, you can't just say they're now at 15 times reserves, let's just raise the reserve requirements by 15 times. You, you destroy the banking system, and they, they know that. They're, they're not stupid, I mean, but they have to make those adjustments. I think you creep it up, you take advantage of the fact that interest rates are relatively low right now, so you just raise up your reserve requirement, reserve uh, interest rate, the half a point or something, and you hold those back, and then you start feeding this out, and you keep jockeying this as you, you piece out the, the, uh, the reserves. So there, there's a way to do this, but you see it's all kind of balancing act, kind of, Wow, I hope they get it right, you know, uh, and we have to hope for that. Going back to the um, discussion on velocity, couldn't the, that dramatic decline in turnover money since like 2008 partly be because no one's spending money? Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's part of it. And this is part of my notion about pulling, uh, pushing on a string that the Fed increases uh, the, the, the bank reserves and so on, and, and then the money supply, they're forcing the money supply up uh, by simply overpowering the situation. But this is, this is what it means to push a string. You can't force them to buy. <laughs> you can't force the them. Consumer spending is starting to It's, it's starting to move, but, but you, you can't force them to borrow. You can't force them to buy. And, and so they're pushing harder and faster than, than people are responding. And that's <laughs> that pile up of money and bank reserves and the velocity sort of collapsing. So that's, that's, yeah, you got it. Go out there and buy. Let's yes. Shop. Still, we gotta go shopping. Got to help the economy. Got to go on a shopping spree. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we'll take a, a break here. Uh, we'll come back in what? Fifteen. Okay. Quarter okay. two. I know you guys have a split <clears throat> second escape to Lake Ridge uh, plan. So uh, 
quarter to as usual. Take That'll give us a yeah, few minutes to switch around here, and then Ja will. Thank you, Steve. My pleasure.